You're watching World Insight. Coming up, Turing Award winner John Edward Hopcroft on computer science and education reforms. Stay with us. Welcome back. This is World Insight with our special series, Brilliant Minds. Now I talk to Cornell University's professor John Edward Hopcroft. He's a recipient of computer science most prestigious award, the Turing Award. He's an American theoretical computer scientist. His textbooks are regarded as standard in the field. He shared with me his insights as an educator and scientist on how to act in a time of transformation. They will be able to program on these. Yeah, I started my career in 1964, and I, I graduated from Stanford in electrical engineering. But fortunate for me, there was a faculty member at Princeton who thought computers were going to be important, and he thought they ought to teach a computer science course. And so he hired me to do that. And I didn't know what a computer science course was because there had never been one before and there were no books. And so I just looked at the literature and summarized some of it. And teaching that course, and after uh, the end of the course, I took one of the students and he and I wrote, took the notes and wrote a book. But because there were no other books, and everybody started computer science the next year. Uh, the book was used all over the world and it made my reputation. <laughs> and, and I guess the lesson there is when there's a time of change, there's a time of opportunity. I, I often tell people if I had been in physics, I would still be waiting today for the senior people ahead of me to retire. <laughs> <laughs> I like that the sense of humor. Yeah, well, it, it gave me a lot of opportunities. Uh, things that, when I was maybe 40, our president uh, appointed me to our National Science Foundation, and I was confirmed by the Senate. And, but that kind of an opportunity just doesn't come along early in your life. But they needed a computer scientist. And Be at the right place at, at the right time, time for the right reason. Right. Mm. Yeah, no, that, that's very important. But it has to be the right person. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm not sure of that. The time, right place at the right time may make the person. <laughs> You're but, so uh, modest, uh, Professor. Well, uh, but the one thing I do do is I enjoy what I'm doing. Mm. And that's one of the messages I'd like to get to students. Uh, don't major in computer science because it's going to give you a high paying job. Uh, major in what you really enjoy, because the purpose of a university education is to prepare you to have a good life. Mm. And you don't want to take a job just to earn money. What is good life? Well, that's, that's a good question. You, ha you have to understand uh, what you enjoy, and that's what you want to do. Mm. So if you like music, you know, major in music and find, find a career where what you're doing you really enjoy. In fact, I talked to a number of Nobel Prize winners and Turing Award winners, and I asked them what they did that made them so successful. And they said they had no strategic plan. That what they did is if an opportunity came along and it sounded like it would be fun, they took it. Otherwise, they ignored it. And. Uh, this, it's, it's some of the soft skills that we've got to teach students. It's, it's not the technical material you learn in the class that's important. Mm -hmm. uh, it's learning how to solve problems, how to communicate, how to interact with other students. Uh, and most faculty don't realize that's what they're really teaching. <laughs> yeah, indeed. You have been very outspoken professor over the past years about the nature of education and the quote unquote, the skills that need to be learned, right. if it can be learned. Right. So tell us more about where are we in terms of education that you see uh, from your perspective and, and how much still needs to be done? Yeah, uh, China is working very hard to create uh, 
world-class education. And what your senior government officials have told me, they said in the past it was either agriculture, gold, or oil that made nations great. In the future, those things are not going to be relevant. It's going to be talent. And those nations that increase education, the quality of education, will become the leading nations. And improving education is one of your nation's highest priorities. In fact, that's the reason I come here. Uh, I've, I've worked in 15 other countries. And I would go and I would teach a course and I'd help a few students or I'd work with 10 faculty to improve teaching and help a few faculty, but I had no impact on their educational system. Mm. And, but when I came to China and I found it was a very high priority, I found I had the opportunity to actually impact the system. Tell us more about that. Um, so uh, one of the things in the past, um, universities were evaluated by their international ranking. And the international ranking was based on research money and number of papers published, which has almost nothing to do uh, with the quality of education. And now they're shifting to evaluating the, the quality of teaching. They'll have someone uh, sit in on a lecture and see if the person teaching the course is engaging the students, uh, is excited about the material and knowledgeable. And then they look to see what the students are doing. Are the students really paying attention and absorbing the material? And they're actually ranking uh, universities. Actually, I got the opportunity to do that. Uh, your former premier uh, invited me over uh, and asked me to chair an international advisory board on how to improve education in China. And I thought that's going to be hard, elementary school, high school, and so forth. But then I was told our report could be at most one page. And the, we, the committee talked about this and we decided maybe we'll just focus on uh, undergraduate education and we'll think what is the one message that we can give the premier. Mm -hmm. And we decided to change the metrics by which universities were evaluated. Mm -hmm. And he told the Ministry of Education to do it. Uh, they gave me permission to evaluate computer science, one discipline, at the top 40 universities. Mm -hmm. And I have about 200 faculty that sit in on lectures. Uh, they just spend a couple days with this project. They're not more than that. Um, and we evaluate the universities. And after the end of the year, I write each president and tell them you're in the top one third, middle third, or bottom third. I see. Uh, the ranking is not good enough to say you're one, two, three, but it's, it's obvious it's all, you're different if you're in the top third than they're in the bottom third. Do you have to be very diplomatic when you are informing them you are in no. the bottom third? No, uh, I just tell them what it is. And then I give the Vice Minister of Education the complete data. And for a few years, the Ministry of Education wasn't still wasn't interested in doing it because it would be better if they did it than me. But this year, they've decided this is important and they want to do it. And uh, the Ministry of Education noticed that the quality of teaching improved at 40 universities and that it was probably due to the ranking. Mm. And, there, and they also see the impacts on the students graduated over the past few years. That they may have, yeah. I, I don't know how they observe this. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but they want to extend it to, instead of one discipline, all disciplines, and instead of 40 universities, 1,500. Wow, Professor, you're making a difference. It will, yeah, but see, it's what I enjoy. What was it like when you heard the news that they're going to do it in a well, much I'm not, larger it's, scale? It's, I'm not clear that they're absolutely going to do it. They came to me and uh, talked about could we reduce the cost. Mm. I mean, their project is so much bigger. And the way to do that, there are cameras in most classrooms. And if there's one watching the teacher and one watching the class, uh, you don't have to take a faculty member from another university and transport them here and have them physically sit in on for an hour and a half and then at break. Uh, that way, it seems the people I have only get two le lectures a day. But if they could stay home at their institution, in five minutes they could evaluate of course, and they could do 20 a day. Mm. And that would reduce the cost by a factor of 10. And 
but we can also make it uh, objective. But instead of having a person uh, have an AI system evaluate how, uh, how well is the faculty member engaging the students and how excited about material. These are things you can measure uh, uh, with an AI system. And, and also looking at the, the students evaluate them. How are you evaluating the latest development of artificial intelligence? Uh, the word artificial intelligence is, is kind of a poor word to use because people think we're actually creating machines which are may become intelligent, <laughs> but, but they're not. Uh, and I don't know what intelligence means. In the past... Even you, Professor, doesn't know what intelligent means. No, uh, but in the past, I thought it was the ability to solve a difficult problem. But a, a computer can now play chess better than you can. Mm -hmm. And it's not intelligent. It's, it's just there's a game tree, and it can search that tree faster than you can. It's, it's just faster. Uh, I can give you examples of... I mean, if you ask a person, uh, let's say there's a road where a lot of people are jaywalking, and you ask a person how to solve it, they'll say maybe put up a fence or something. If you ask a computer, it may say eliminate the road. Uh, you know, if, if the computer was intelligent, it wouldn't give an answer like that. Uh, so it's, it's not, at least in my view, we're not even close to intelligence. Uh, the computer doesn't know <laughs> something particularly doesn't know when it makes a mistake. And, uh, so I don't think we'll have real intelligence in the foreseeable future. Uh, it, it's, but uh, our, what we call artificial intelligence is going to uh, automate so many jobs that it's going to create the following problem. It may be that China is only going to need a small fraction of its population uh, to produce all the goods and services it needs. What are you going to do with these other people? We don't know. Yeah, but you don't want them out there doing nothing and maybe causing some trouble. Uh, so we're going to have to develop a, a strategy, you know, maybe get people to figure out how to enjoy life mm -hmm. if they don't have to work. Professor, how do you see, you know, now everybody is focusing on artificial intelligence. Is that something natural, you think? Um, no, I think the, the focus may be because it's going to lead to a good job. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the, it is that. Um, and I think pretty soon it's going to spread. Well, in fact, it's already spreading to other fields like agriculture, biology, right. medicine, and so on. And then it won't be so much computer science, information science oriented. Uh, and I notice that many computer scientists now are researching with people in these other disciplines. Uh, during my lifetime, we focused on making computers useful. Uh, but computers are useful now, so computer science is changing in a fundamental way. Right. And now we're focusing on, well, what are they being used for? You know, your generation has been doing so much, contributing so much to where we are today when it comes to computer science. Uh, you were the pioneers, in fact. But how do you, you know, on the one hand, stay with what is going on right now, but on the other hand, also have a very cool mind about the retrospect, you know, where we were right. and where we are going? Right. Um, it, actually, I'm no longer really uh, keeping up with research. I mean, I, I sort of understand what people are doing but I'm not trying to push it forward uh, because I concluded that I can have a much bigger role in increasing the quality of education uh, in computer science and other disciplines, that that's something that'll affect the lives of millions of people. Uh, whereas if I work on research, uh, I can get another research paper <laughs> and so on. But uh, it, it's, uh, as you get older, what you enjoy doing or what you want to do is different. And a, a lot of people, uh, when they get to be their 60s, they decide they want to do something that's going to have a major impact on making on the world lives. better. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. I see you are doing infrastructure. 
But do you see there is a, a lack of a connect between education and the latest trends of science and technology? The people who are really connected are the scientists doing it. But the vast majority of the population are, are not connected. They, they realize the world is changing, uh, but they probably don't realize how much it's changing. Uh, my own view is we've had two previous revolutions, the agricultural and the industrial. And now we're going to have, I'll call it maybe an information revolution or something like that. And it's going to have a bigger impact than these others. Mm. In that uh, sequence, it seems that uh, the latest uh, technology advancement will be very much bring a huge uh, change in the relationship among humans as well. Oh, yes, yes. And we hope it's going to be a good <laughs> uh, thing. I mean, one of the things um, uh, with digital communication, I don't think people interact anywhere near as much today as they did when I was growing up. Uh, having a personal interaction, you know, it's important to get to know people and uh, so on, and that's something we better think about. Uh, so there are lots of interesting problems, and they're, they're not in computer and information science. They're in many other disciplines to make sure, you know, that people still interact, that uh, things like that. And, that's, and That's very important. Yeah, and I used to read a newspaper, which what was in it was factually correct, it may, may have been a little misleading in what they covered. Uh, but today, uh, with digital communication, you're not sure that even what you're hearing is factually correct. How do you see um, the future trends of science and technology? Oh, I, 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 it, it's going to be important um, because uh, Earlier, like in the agricultural revolution, you could just try something and it was simple enough. You could learn by ex experiment. Uh, today, agriculture is so complex. In fact, they're using AI to measure the, temp the, the uh, moisture in the ground to know whether they should water it or save some water. Uh, you can't run a farm today without a significant amount of science. And I, I understand that uh, global warming is creating a serious problem, that farmers have already noticed it. Uh, the ground stays wetter for longer and they can't plow it. And they have a shorter growing season for this reason and, and it's affecting their economy. Uh, so they are, they are really now, science is gonna be very important to them. Uh, what what uh, crops should they switch to, thing, things like this. Uh, and, and it makes a difference as to whether you're going to be profitable or not. You, with your age, right. have gone through many transformational periods in the past decades. Right. Some were more pleasant than the others. Um, how do you see where we are today? And do we learn from our earlier experiences? Well, one thing that might help us is the experience, the changes are coming faster. Uh, during the Industrial Revolution, it took maybe 200 years. And so the people who were born towards the end of it didn't realize all the problems and how they had to be solved. Uh, now, uh, it, it, by the time you get out of high school, you've probably seen some changes. And, uh, Indeed. So, so we may, we may learn a little bit better. There's more urgency. Right, right. Uh, because, you know, my, my parents told me about the changes in their lifetime. Uh, they said there was electricity, uh, there was automobiles, and they said there's going to be greater changes in your lifetime. And I wondered about it, but during my lifetime, we had television, uh, we had uh, a jet aircraft, uh, People traveled by boat if you wanted to come to China and there. Uh, uh, we had got the internet. Uh, we got uh, just enormous number of changes. And there will be even more changes uh, in my grandchildren's uh, time. Mm. Sounds exciting, if we can yeah. learn. Right.
Professor, always a pleasure talking to you. Yes, Thank no. you so much. Oh, I, I enjoy coming here. Thank right. you. Yeah. And that's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to know more, you can always find us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. On behalf of my team, thanks for watching. I'm Tian Wei. Bye for now.